Uh, can you all hear me? Good. Uh, someone asked Beckett what he uh, thought of Burroughs' work, and he said rather grudgingly, well, he's a writer. So, uh, certainly that's true of Kerouac. I'm uh, quoting here from a historic memoir of America's greatest existentialist. I mean, he was, uh, he was the greatest existing exister. Certainly a meaningless word. Well, Kerouac, Kerouac was a writer. Uh, that is, he wrote. Uh, many people who call themselves writers and have their names down on book jackets are not writers and they can't write. The difference being a bullfighter who fights a bull is different from a bullshitter who makes passes with no bull there. <laughs> Uh, the writer has been there, he couldn't write about it. And going there, he risked being gored. By that, I mean uh, what the Germans call a time ghost. Um, Fitzgerald wrote the Jazz Age, but he never found his own way back. And a whole migrant uh, generation arose from on the roads uh, to Morocco and Nigeria and Tangiers and so on. Well, Kerouac himself uh, stayed pretty much in America. Uh, what are writers doing? And I can find the use of this term to writers of novels. Well, in one sense, they're trying to create a universe uh, in which they have lived or where, where they would like to live. Uh, to what extent writers can actually do or how useful it is for their uh, craft to act out their writing in so-called real life is a very open question. Uh, for example, uh, are you uh, making, the, uh, making your world more like real life or are you pulling real life into your work? Uh, for example, Hemingway's determination to act out the least interesting aspects of his own writing and to actually be his main character uh, was, uh, I feel, very unfortunate for his writing. I mean, if a writer insists on doing and doing well, uh, what his characters do, he, he very drastically limits his characters. In The Vanity of Deleuze, uh, Kerouac confesses uh, to being a spy in someone else's body. He says that all his, uh, his credentials, his press clippings, his birth certificates are just completely uh, spurious. They're not real. And I think it's a, uh, it's a professional feeling that all writers, uh, all writers experience. And this arises from the dualism of being uh, actor and chronicler at the same time. As you're pretending to be one of the actors while he's actually uh, the scriptwriter, or trying to be. And this tends to give writers a vaguely ill-intentioned and furtive manner. Writers are bad by nature. No trouble, no, uh, no story, no film, no novel, no painting. So if we can't find trouble, we tend to make it. Oh, uh, not directly, you understand, simply by the contagion of our ambiguous presence. On the surface, Kerouac was a nonviolent person and completely non-hostile. Uh, and his sneaky writer trick surfaced in other ways. For example, I have never been able to divest myself of the trust fund that he foisted upon me. I mean, there, there isn't any trust fund. There never was a trust fund. Uh, when I was uh, not able to support myself, which was many years, uh, my family, I was supported by an allowance from my family, my hard-working parents who ran a gift and art shop in Palm Beach, Florida, 
called Cobblestone Gardens. My father was the only straight man in the industry. But you see, Kerouac thought a trust fund was more interesting and more romantic. Uh, let's face it, there was a very uh, strong uh, sort of Sunday supplement streak in his mind. Uh, he also saddled me with a Russian countess. Well, she's a little bit easier to get rid of than the trust fund. And he uh, nurtured the myth of the Burroughs Millions. There are no Burroughs Millions, except in the company and the, uh, the family. Uh, got nothing out of it. I mean, it's an old, old story how the inventor's family winds up with zilch. Uh, <clears throat> incompetent executors, they advised the children that the whole thing was absolutely impractical and they better sell out right now for what they could get. Uh, which they did, which was a very small amount. Um, uh, then I, I asked Kerouac about this. Uh, what is this trust fund nonsense? Uh, and he said, oh, well, you'll see you will have a trust fund. Such chick, he's going to write me a trust fund. Um, well, writers are prone to very, very specific character flaws, and Kerouac had them all. No doubt about it that he was a writer. Uh, well, since writers inhabit a fictional world, there's always an element of spuriousness when they touch down. Uh, Kerouac hated fights. I've seen him uh, go out way out of his way to avoid fights in bars. Uh, but he liked to talk fights, you know, the uh, left hook syndrome. And what an old fraud was Hemingway, the great white hunter, dropping his wildebeest neat and clean at 320 African paces. Got long legs, you know. Uh, but people uh, will tend to take these roles, the writer's role, uh, quite seriously, and many did see Kerouac as sort of the tough, brawling type. Uh, and this is what we might call a writer's gap. It's most evident and damaging in their personal and sexual lives, but I don't propose to discuss that. It sets a bad precedent. And I uh, don't uh, snitch on a fellow writer. He'll snitch on himself sooner or later. As Mon said, and now and again he did say interesting things, just moments of clarity in the incredibly stupid and empty uh, way of life. Uh, if you know how to read, that is, he says, uh, writing marks a man, uh, it reveals a man completely no matter what he, writes, what, what he writes about. Any writer stands completely revealed in his writing, if you know how to read. And of course, the profession uh, marks someone just as any profession does, being a doctor or a policeman or a lawyer. Um, Kerouac never doubted his uh, profession as a writer. He never thought of being anything else. When I first met him, uh, he'd already written, that was, um, I think he was 20 years old, and he had already written a million words. Never, uh, never thought of any other, any other profession. I don't know if Kerouac ever asked himself uh, what a writer is actually doing. It's a dangerous question for a writer. I mean, what is anyone doing, really doing, uh, what indeed? Well, the answer is probably too horrific to be countenanced. Uh, and who was Kerouac? Well, a college athlete, a merchant seaman, a railroad worker, a Zen Buddhist, a conservative Catholic. Uh, all these, I think, essentially, of course, he was a traveler, but he's an American traveler. Uh, he hated Europe, and he hated North Africa, and he never really felt comfortable outside of America. So while many of the people that really went on the road 
uh, after reading On the Road, uh, went a hell of a lot further than Kerouac. They were the ones that went out to um, uh, Kathmandu and the Far East and down into Africa. Uh, well, Kerouac, he touched a wide range, but he didn't, he didn't venture outside of this range. He never attempts to contact and transcribe um, alien, alien data. Even uh, Dr. Sachs is much too personal and homey to constitute a venture outside his uh, chosen area, where f uh, fiction and fact are intermingled. Uh, since everyone assumed that he was writing um, uh, actual, accurate biography, and actually wasn't at all. And he achieves, in fact, an insidious blurring of the line between fact and fiction, uh, which has produced uh, far-reaching, even worldwide effects. Apart from his writing, uh, Kerouac was a figure of worldwide import. And the beat movement uh, spread everywhere, even to the Arab world in the Far East. It met and blended uh, with Zen and married Castro and Raul to father the hippies and the yippies. It was a real, a real powder trail. Um, we see the function of creation uh, to make people aware of what they know and don't know that they know. You see that uh, Rome, uh, I mean, um, Kerouac touched many areas. Now, there's a tradition in Europe called the Wonder Year, the Wonder Year, uh, during which middle-class youths are supposed to hit the road and make it on their own for a year with very little or no money. Uh, then he will come back and go into the family business or profession. So uh, they'd already... They'd already, uh, the experience was already there, but he, he put new vigor into these rather petrified old world procedures. And the uh, hippies and the yippies were contacting the third world on a very basic levels of drugs, sex, and money. And rock and roll, of course. But Jack seemed uh, sort of anxious to disclaim responsibility. I don't know how seriously we take this. The spy in his body recants under pressure. Um, the only valid criteria, I think, of accomplishments, in, in the words of Christ, by their fruits ye shall know them, and not by their disclaimers. Um, well, what is a writer actually doing? I put forward as a general proposition that any artist, and I include uh, all creative thinkers, uh, they are trying to make the viewer, the reader, the student aware of what he knows and doesn't know that he knows. Uh, people living on the seacoast in the Middle Ages, they knew the earth was round. They believed the earth was flat. And uh, Galileo got in quite uh, serious shit by saying the earth was round. Still is. And... Uh, Cezanne shows people what a, what a fish looks like, seen from a certain angle in a certain light. They couldn't see it. But now any child can see Cezanne's fish. Once you get the breakthrough, then there's a general increase in uh, general awareness. And Joyce made people aware of their uh, uh, stream of consciousness, at least on one level, and was called unintelligible. Uh, the cut-ups, which were started by Brian uh, Geisen, well, uh, life is a cut-up. Every time you uh, walk down the street, look out the window, uh, your consciousness is cut by random factors. And we simply made the random factor explicit with a pair of scissors. Now, Carraway didn't like the idea. He said, I do this in my mind. Well, I said, uh, then you've excluded the essential ingredient of randomity. The throw of the dice, the clip of the coin, uh, the blast of a gun. I uh, exhibited a picture here uh, created by first painting a piece of plywood, both sides, uh, letting my hand have its way, just like I sat down and, and typed a page on the typewriter. Now, uh, randomity is evoked. I pour paint into a little plastic pot bag 
and uh, tack it to the plywood, not just anywhere. It's, uh, I know exactly where I'm going to place it. Now, with a double barrel 12 gauge shotgun, number six shot, at 20 feet I blast the paint bag, throwing paint all over the painted wood. Now, see, no one could have foreseen the results in his mind. Uh, it's impossible. Uh, this is the Big Bang theory of creation. We have, a, <clears throat> we have an outpouring of creation uh, which slowly solidifies into art. Time for a bigger bang. Suppose the whole fabric of reality, what you see out there from your window, grass, people, trees, houses, uh, mountain, sky, the whole fucking shit house is suddenly ripped apart and revealed as a backdrop. The sheltering sky is thin as paper here. BB is designed to blow a hole in time. All it takes is one shot with the right ammunition. Well, Kerouac, uh, with his theory that all life is a dream and that nothing is real, I think uh, would have subscribed to that. Uh, so, he couldn't have done it, couldn't have done it in his mind, and you can't even um, figure out how a cut paper would come out. Uh, now, novelists are also um, engaged in the ultimate blasphemy, that is, novelists, of the creation of life, the creation of living characters, uh, which is... it. Writing is quite literally table tapping. It's a, it's a psychic operation. Um, well, it's a very useful to act out, and there are very definite rules of evocation. If you don't, if you don't use the right evocation, your character won't, uh, won't be there. Now, I think it's very useful to act out a scene you're writing. Uh, where is the door where this character came in, the door that he went out of? Now, I've had the experience of uh, finding a scene, of writing a scene. It's this sticking together here. Yeah. Of writing a scene and reading it over. And I said, there's something not right here. It just isn't working. So I acted out, well, no wonder you had the character coming, coming through a door where there is no door and seeing things that he couldn't have seen. In other words, I was asking my characters to perform impossible acts. Uh, I remember the fi a film called Dead of Night where the ventriloquist dummy starts talking on its own. Well, a writer must encourage this phenomenon. Create a dummy and induce it to talk on its own. Now, this is known as an ear for dialogue in the trade. But you see, writing is, in fact, a magical operation. If you know the right spells, and what are spells but words, you can call all the living, all writers living and dead to write for you, to work for you. Uh, the cut up, the use of cut up is a key. Uh, what better way to evoke a writer than to cut and rearrange his very own words? Like all keys to be used with caution, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Somebody changed the lock on that door. Well, another key is certainly image. What does your character look like? I build up an identical picture. Uh, there's a picture of a magazine or newspaper that uh, looks like the, the character I'm looking for. And I've also used uh, pose photos. Oh, yeah. Here we are. Well, uh, writers are uh, exposed to many traps. There are many snares. There's writer's block when the writer can't write at all, and there's a facility that can uh, become mechanical and lifeless. Uh, now, Kerouac always said that the first version is always the best. Well, that seemed to work for him. Um, but... 
I told him, well, that works for you, Carolyn, but it doesn't necessarily work for anyone else. It certainly never worked for me. I have to do a lot of editing. Um, Sinclair Lewis said that if you've written something you think is just great and you can't wait to show it to somebody, said, throw it away, it's terrible. <laughs> now, <clears throat> this is very often true. I've had the experience, say, of writing something that I thought was just great, and I read it the next day, and I said, for God's sakes, tear it into very small pieces and throw it in somebody else's garbage can. It's just awful. And uh, that is one of the um, deterrents to writing. Um, the amount of bad writing you're going to have to do before you do any good writing. I think it would be very interesting to collect all the worst writing of a number of uh, writers, like starting with Titus Andronicus. And with that great le line, uh, let us repair and order well a state that like events may ne'er it ruinate. <laughs> oh boy, there's, there's Shakespeare for you. <clears throat> um, but of course, if the writer is wise, he's destroyed them. I personally have destroyed uh, at least a thousand pages. Um, Well, that's one. There, there's the, uh, the trap of writer's block and an excessive facility, the great book that nobody can read. Well, that's, uh, that, of course, was Joyce. He spent years and years, 20 years, writing the great book that nobody can read. Finnegan's Wake. And, of course, uh, there is uh, the bargain, the devil's bargain. Um, I think it's a tribute to Kerouac's essential integrity that he was never approached with the devil's bargain, uh, which means that he never laid himself open to the bargain. Now, the bargain can come in many forms. There's Hollywood, a rich wife, a bestseller. Did, did Truman Capote ever write anything comparable to Marion and other voices, other rooms, after he wrote In Cold Blood? Best sellers are written to the best of the writer's ability. If the writer makes the bargain, then that is his ability from there on out. The bargain is not to be taken lightly. Of course, a classic case of the bargain, and he even knew it, that he had made the devil's bargain, was uh, Somerset Maugham. Now, the fool's pact, oh, uh, Conrad said that the... Um, Devil's bargain is always a fool's bargain. He was a wary, wary old seaman. But the fool's pack goes, as far as Maughan is concerned, I will make you rich. I will make you a uniquely famous writer. I will give you fame and lunches with the queen and royalty at your door, asking you to be invited to the so chic, so empty, so nowhere. Welcome to the biggest closet in the Mediterranean. As you can see, there is nothing, nothing here. You see, in his haste to sign, he hadn't even read the large print. The devil doesn't say anything about making him a good writer, or even a writer who maybe had written one good thing. Of course not. The devil deals only in quantitative merchandise. So for an artist who deals in quality, the devil's bargain is the worst and stupidest bargain possible. It really is a fool's bargain. Uh, Maughan screamed out petulantly at a party when his champagne was late or something. I don't expect much as a thoroughly second-rate writer. I don't deserve much. Good, sir, to the purpose. I hope you remembered as being in the first rank of the second-raters. Sorry, Mr. William, there is no such rank. Uh, second-raters uh, get into the uh, first rank by maybe writing a paragraph, a story that is first rate, that lifts them out of the second rate category. Uh, you never did. It's all dead, level, and mortal. No wonder he didn't believe in immortality. But he denies it to his readers in every line that never comes alive and never breathes. The whole thing never gets off the ground. If this is a space age, Maughan has nothing to say to us. You never feel uplifted or changed or far out after reading Maughan. It is last year as he was wringing his hands, saying that he was a horrible and evil man. He was indeed. 
There is nothing in his work but a dead, malevolent spirit, a specialized brand of English evil. He sports rather well, you know. Uh, no, that you try to remember the hero of the raves at Razor's Edge. What a profoundly uninspirational book. Uh, none of them. You just can't remember them. There's really nothing there. Because somebody else who made the bargain, he had a hell of a lot more to sell than Mom, was Hemingway, sold out to Hollywood for a safari. He wrote one of the best stories on death in the English language, The Snows of Kilimanjaro. Uh, he knew a lot about it. He could smell it on others. There's a famous story where the, uh, he met a general, and he was a real general lover. So they drive out and uh, <clears throat> meet this colonel, uh, no, major, major, who was in charge of some outpost. Yeah, the general saying, I'll have to relieve him. And Ernie says, you won't have to relieve him, Bucky. He stinks of death. And by the time they got back to the general headquarters, the major had been killed. Uh, so he wrote his story. And it was certainly it was the best thing he ever wrote about. Uh, the story about death was his, his specialty. And he lets Hollywood put a happy ending on it. A real live pilot comes in with penicillin. <laughs> Even the vultures flap away in disgust at that sellout. <laughs> you see, he had a unique opportunity. It could have been a great film about death. And it isn't about death at all. It isn't about shit. Um, Thought he could pay death off with Hollywood crap, did he? Remember that old lady? It must be very dangerous to be a writer. Uh, him, it is, madam, and few survive it. Uh, there's, wait a minute, I find it here. There's a famous line by, oh, here we are, yes. Uh, for years, Dryden held undisputed title to the most atrocious conceit in the English language for his breathtaking lines on Lord Hastings' smallpox. Each little pimple had a tear in it to raise, to wail the fault its rising did commit. Uh, now Dryden must defend his title against Papa Hemingway. The hole in his forehead where the bullet went in was about the size of a pencil. The hole in the back of his head where the bullet came out was big enough to put your fist in it, if it was a small fist and you wanted to put it there. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I reckon the hole in the back of his head where two barrels of number six heavy duck load came out was big enough to put your foot in. Even if it was a medium-sized foot and you didn't want to put it there. <clears throat> but Kerouac uh, is never approached. There's, of course, a certain moment of sellout. I think Maughan was born uh, sold out. Uh, Hemingway tends to sell himself a piece at a time, his macho image slowly eating away at his talent. Uh, there was that atrocious letter he wrote about duck hunting. I'd shoot my own mother if she was flying straight and clean in formation, and I could lead her at 50 yards with my Weatherby. Oh, my God. My God. Uh, well, I'll be here. Well, I put together a... Uh, a poem here from, um, I was struck by the similarity between the ending of uh, The Great Gatsby and the ending of On the Road. You know, some rather nice lines came out. Enchanted moment when man held his tomorrow for the last time in history with his capacity for wonder. Dim houses begin to melt away and fold the final shore. Uh... Trees whisper to the last forlorn Dean Moriarty. All that road and nobody, nobody in the immensity of it. Children cry for, that tra for the transitory father we never found, never, never found face to face. Old Dean's gone, an obscene word scrawled by bright stars. At the end of Daisy's dock. The stars are dropping, dropping silver dimes. Night blesses the river pier. Old Dean's gone. The orgiastic future. 
The last and greatest of Dean Moriarty dreaming in future children. With no matter, they let children cry. Uh, Broken human dreams, and the stars go out one after the other. Thank you. I think I'll... Oh, I should mention another, uh, speaking of all the difficulties by which the writer is uh, faced, uh, alcoholism, which has been called the... Um, which, of course, killed Kerouac, has been called the writer's vice. It's to be remembered that writing is a very stressful activity. Uh, when you write, you're experiencing hate, uh, fear, war, death, uh, but you're sitting there immobilized at the typewriter. And I think that this, um, which is essential, whether you're sitting in a typewriter or writing on longhand, which nobody hardly does now and doesn't make a hell of a lot of difference, but you're sitting there immobilized in a state of stress, and I think the uh, alcoholism is often a, um, uh, an attempt to relieve the accompanying um, um, tension and anxiety. Well, I think we could have some uh, questions now. We've got about an hour left. Uh, yes, I don't think we need a we need a microphone. Go ahead. I never used the word. I, I never used the word process. I wouldn't know how, but I know that I had a recent experience that they're terribly useful in editing. No, I don't think in composition so much as in editing. No, I use a typewriter. It's the plainest sort of typewriter. I'm practically illiterate longhand. Hmm. You see them both. It's like a film. Exactly. The writer is sitting there and he's he's looking at a film and he's trying to get it on paper. That's what's happening. I think we had one over there. Well, that's an either or proposition uh, that presupposes there's some line down in the middle. That would be unfortunate if there were. Um, but I just don't think corresponds to the facts. I don't, I don't know what, what love means, God knows. Presumably it's sort of a mixture between sex and liking. <laughs> That's as close as I can tell. Uh, well, I'll tell you, it, I read it over and I thought it was pretty terrible. Uh, so it's, it's in the archives in Vaduz. I did save it, but um, I wouldn't want to publish it. I'm not going to dig out my high school themes and publish them. It just wasn't good. I can do a hell of a lot better now. There wasn't any point really in publishing it. Uh, yeah. I don't understand the question. Money. Well, he was, uh, Kerouac was, uh, was uh, quite a reader. He had read Joyce extensively. And uh, I know he was influenced, uh, certainly was influenced by Joyce. He was certainly influenced by Thomas Wolfe and by Céline. But he re really read uh, extraordinary extent. 
Yes, I think there probably was an influence there. Yes. Well, uh, sometimes it worked one way and sometimes another. I think I turned him on to say, Lee, and I believe he turned me on to one of the principal influences in my work, Denton Welch. So it worked both ways. <clears throat> yes. Well, for heaven's sakes, it needs control and time in which to control. People even need time in which to die. Well, yes, it's the principal means. I would say. Uh, yes. I think they have them in the library here. You sure? Because I at one time I got one of them from the library here. Uh, the and I forget which one the. The main ones are Maiden Voyage. There aren't so many, you see. There's Maiden Voyage and Youth is Pleasure. Uh, Voice Through a Cloud. That was the last that he, that he wrote. There was also some short stories, The Brave and Cruel. They may have another name somewhere else. And um, the journals. And then some fragments. See, he died when he was 31. Hmm? He killed what? Uh, I forget who published them in England. Someone named Fisher published some of them in America. But I don't know. I think uh, about five years ago, the University of Texas brought out a voice through the cloud, a cloud. And I, I know I did get uh, one of them here in the library. I found someone here who had them all. Hmm. Well, no, it's, uh, you can use any process you want. I mean, yeah. Uh, no, it's usually, I just want to get a new angle on what I've just written. I don't do it all the time. But sometimes I'll do it and I'll get a, a sentence that's useful or a sentence that uh, orients me in some way. I do it sort of for, for orientation now. Well, I usually I'll take a page, take a page, cut it up and arrange it around and see if it looks any better that way. That's about what it amounts to. Uh, yes. Yes. That's right. Well, yes, it doesn't, it, it, it's, no, it's just a method. It's just a method like, a technique in painting or something like that, it may be suitable in one place and not in another. I was trying to just uh, tell a straight story there. There are cut-ups in there. It, it's still useful in a straight context for uh, transcribing something that is confused, say like a delirium, a fever delirium, or something like that. You'll do much better by taking what you want and cutting it up than you would by trying to concoct a fever delirium. That's right. Mm hmm Absolutely. Yes. Well, it just seems to me that, uh, that um, in many cases, poets are lazy prose writers. I can take, I've just done it. I can take a, uh, a, po uh, a page of poetic prose and cut it up into lines and rearrange it and call it poetry. As soon as you get away from, from strict met metric traditions, uh, then why? What do you? What's the difference between prose and poetry? There isn't any. Well, there's there's no no sign of that. There certainly is no substitute in sight that I can see in in any uh, wide sense. Well, it depends on, on how much time I have. Uh, sometimes uh, I won't do it for a long time, then I'll do it. And, but I always, I always naturally keep my eyes open for material.
Uh, yes, well, get a point on the yeah. Well, I, if I can't see it, I can't write it. I think if I can't see the, I can't see the writer. The uh, the reader is not going to see him or her. So I've got to see it. And there's no difference between seeing and hearing. I mean, uh, you've got the person. Now, what's what will such a person say? What tone of voice would he say it in? Actually, a lot of the general sort of. Uh, Tradecraft of writing is quite similar to the tradecraft of intelligence. Uh, as teach students to keep their eyes open on the street. If they see a person more than three times, take a good look. It may be someone that has something to say to you. Maybe he's a character trying for an audition, you see. I pick, I get many of my characters right out of the street like that. A writer, a writer shouldn't try to create in a vacuum, just the writer and his typewriter. Writer. These people that hold themselves up to write the great American novel, they're cutting their input. They haven't got anything to write about. A balance, of course, you've got to find a balance there because it takes, just tell me how many books someone uh, has written and I can tell you how long he had to sit at a typewriter. That is one of the things about the profession. You have to be able to sit hours and hours and hours, years and years and years at a typewriter or, well, most all, oh, that's uh, one of Sinclair Lewis's uh, pieces of advice to young writers learn to type. I agree entirely. Almost nobody uses longhand anymore. Uh, yes. <laughs> What, what effect they had on Kerouac's writing? Well, uh, I don't know. He talks more about them this, uh, uh, without uh, incorporating their ideas into his writing, it seems to me. I can't think of very clear examples of influence there, yes. I don't understand you. Why do what? There is. If it isn't, it's, it isn't much good. Uh, I remember Genet uh, talking about uh, Julian Green. says, Il n'y a pas le courage d'être un écrivain. He doesn't have the courage to be a writer. Uh, he was talking about the courage, for one thing, uh, to take full responsibility for your characters, your creations. Uh, it is a dangerous profession, and that's implicit in the profession. It's very dangerous to be a writer. Because it's my job. If I don't, if I don't do it, I'll starve to death. <laughs> you tell me, telling you what? I need a what? Uh, not unless I uh, collaborated with someone. There have been very few successful collaborations. Very few indeed, yes. Oh, I read, um, let's see, I read a lot of uh, unspeakable horror, that kind of stuff, you know. For airplane chats, it's terribly dull, and I read some spy stuff, and uh, a lot of spy stuff. I read all the Carré. Uh, I don't do much uh, serious reading, or uh, if I do, it's mostly rereading. 
Conrad, Denton Wells, Pierce, Rambo, mostly. Uh, yes. Oh my God, we spent about um, six or seven years on that project. We write a novel about it. Uh, one day, oh yeah, yeah, we're going to do this film, $10 million. And the next day, you can't get through the secretary. That's the way it is. Nothing happens until money actually changes hands. And that only happened once. And that's another story. In, in other words, we have more than thought about it. Uh, done a great deal about it at one time or another. Terry Southern and I went out to Hollywood once and tried to sell it, sell those script, the Naked Lunch script. So on, uh, yes. No, uh, this is a, a funny story. I read this book called Blade Runner, and then I wanted to write a write something. Uh, based on it, very loosely based on it, I may say. And uh, so he got in touch with the, uh, the author is Alan Norris, a writer of science fiction. So we got in touch with him, and he gave his permission to use the title, figuring that it would be good publicity for him. Then, uh, now somebody has taken the, just the title, which has nothing to do with the original title, which is good as far as I'm concerned. But there's no relation between the, uh, even, my con even my concept of the Blade Runner and his. This is, uh, I thought it was a great movie, by the way. Fantastic. I mean, the, the sets there, wow. That's the most impressive uh, sci-fi movie I've seen. Very definitely, far and away. Yeah. How did I overcome my what? Well, the general, uh, general direct, direction is I do something else. Uh, don't do about it. Uh, well, I, in one case, I turned to this art, this uh, Big Bang art, and uh, did a lot of target shooting. Just wait to come out of it, that's all. Some people have it. They never get over it. I know people have written one book, and they just won't write another. Trokey is an example. He wrote Cain's book, and he hasn't written since. Pardon? I haven't seen him in a long, long time. I, I will see him. I'm going to England, and I will see him then. Yeah, it is a great book, and he just wouldn't write. He just won't write anything. So he'd do any, rather do anything than write. Yeah. Oh, everybody was in park. Everybody uses pot. That's the, I think that's the most sort of useful all-around drug, just an adjunct. Uh, yes. I mean, the, the whole question of not writing, I wasn't talking about writing, I was talking about existing in space rather than in time. I feel it would be as definite, as definite a, a transition as the transition from uh, water to land. There's people, uh, creatures living in the water, they look up at the land, they can't imagine what it's like, or only partially imagine what it's like to live up there. And that is the same way, and this will be the next biological step, if it is made, from time into space. It will involve biological changes. Quite inconceivable at the present time, I guess. Um, You're going to shoot a whole time on ammunition we use. Huh? Uh, that is the uh, that is exactly what I'm describing uh, in my current book, The Place of Dead Roads, which starts out as a western, and I'm e exactly describing what kind of ammunition. So, in order to uh, in order to answer your question, I'd have to read the whole book. <laughs> it's about be about uh, 500 pages or 200 250 uh, book pages. Well, you get the manuscript in September. I don't know. I might, might possibly make the spring list, but I doubt it very much. I would say uh, probably next fall. I mean, nice to.
Yeah, well, a year from a year from this uh, this September. Yes. Well, of course I remember where where I lived. Uh, I don't know what's there now. Well, they're small town people. They were they were curious naturally, curious and and uh, somewhat malicious. Like in any small town, you have your friends, your allies, and your enemies. That is, this store is is hostile. This store is friendly, and so you have your set up your route. Um, yeah, of course they're small town people. They're very curious. About anything. Yeah. Huh? Uh, yes, I don't. Uh, yes, I, there's nothing discreditable. God knows. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, yes, I think it's all, it's all, in a sense, one work. You can trace a project, a, pro, a progress, like this. Cities of the Red Knight is the first of a trilogy. Like Naked Launch, uh, then, uh, the Ticket the Explosion of the Soft Machine, and Nova Express, uh, sort of for, formed one group. And, uh, Wild Boys and Exterminator, and Port of Saints formed another. And now I'm starting a new uh, new group with uh, with Studies of the Red Knight, and the book that I'm writing now that I've just finished is a, a, a sequel sequel to uh, Studies of the Red Knight, taking place in um, late uh, late 1800s and, and early uh, 1900s in America and Europe. Uh, yeah. Uh, be, because the theme lended itself to that, uh, I just was. That was the. Uh, I have a complicated enough story anyway. I have two stories going at once, and unless I maintain some sort of of coherence, it would just. Uh, you know, people people just won't read something they can't understand at all. So I felt that I had to really make it uh, coherent and accessible. Well, uh, I I feel it was successful in uh, accomplishing what I set out to accomplish. That's all. I wanted to write quite a uh, straight story, but actually it is a complicated story, very complex story. And I follow more or less the same method in the book that I'm writing now. It's quite straightforward, but a very complicated story. Uh, straightforward in writing, I mean, yes. I never, I never feel any necessity to rationalize anything. I'm a writer, it's my job. That's all. Uh, what's to rationalize? I'm working with words. I, I think they're a very inadequate uh, means of communication and uh, maybe replaced in time, but uh, right now it's what I'm working with. So, yeah.
Well, uh, it's very confusing, actually. The confusion between the... Uh, I've got something here on that subject. Uh, there's nothing more elusive than a writer's main character, the character that is assumed by the reader to be the writer himself, actually doing the things he writes about. Uh, but uh, this main character is simply a point of view interposed by the writer. He's not the writer at all. The main characters then become, and he, he becomes another character in the book, but usually is the most difficult to see because he is mistaken for the writer himself. But he isn't. He's simply uh, the writer's point of observation, rather like a camera. Uh, yes? Oh, um, I didn't have anything to do with it. It was, um, well, I mean, it was a group called the Chicago Project, and they came to me and asked me if they could uh, make these, uh, act out these sections, and I said, sure, go ahead. Which, no, no, not at all. Not at all. Well, they've done not too badly. They've made a little money. Uh, well, get one over here, yes. Have I read what? Uh, I have not read The Executioner's Song, no. I like uh, Norman Mailer very much, and I read The Naked and the Dead, and uh, some of his, a, a little bit of his critical writing. But I don't know his work well at all, not well enough to really formulate a, an opinion. Um, well, let's see. Okay. Yeah. On the subject of unreadable books, have you read anything by Thomas Pynchon? Yes, I read Gravity's Rainbow. And I, yes, I found it very, very, I was, I read, this is a great book, but my God, it's hard to read. It's like wading through molasses. So, uh, well, that's it. The great book that nobody can read, but a lot of people did read it. I think it was rather a good seller. I understand he's very reclusive. That's what I heard. Uh, yes. I've got a copy of Bob Cox's here from England. Uh, what's the status of the American publications? And is that going to have a picture of you? As far as I know, uh, no American publications plan at this point. There probably will be eventually. And as to whether we'll have the pictures, I don't know. But we, we just haven't gotten anything together on that. Uh, yeah. Of what? Oh, I think it was just a title for a short piece. Yeah. Uh, now, well, I think there was a, uh, someone put out a magazine or a pamphlet or something. I don't, I'm not sure. It was a long time ago or some time ago. Yes. How would I sum up the whole uh, Kerouac? Well, I really, <laughs> I really couldn't uh, sum up Kerouac. I've just said he's a writer, was a writer. He wrote, he was important, and he reached and touched millions of people and was very influential with, million, uh, with millions of people and with the whole lifestyle that we see today.